Good morning, church. We are so glad you are joining us today. There's probably a million things on your mind and a hundred distractions all around you wherever you are. Instead of trying to block those things out, focus on each thing as they come to your mind. As they acquire your attention, thank God for them. And if you don't have gratitude, if that thing or person or situation is upsetting or frustrating or difficult, ask God for thanksgiving for that thing or that person or that situation. Instead of asking God to change the things around us, ask Him what He can change in you.
Jesus 
Good morning. So good to be with you this morning. Let me just remind us what we believe and who we are. We believe three things. That there is hope beyond our brokenness. That we are called to trust in our risen Savior. And that we're called to bring restoration to our community. We have this calling and this inheritance and this hope in our life because of what is Jesus, because what Jesus has done for us. And so each and every week we remind each other of this truth because it's easy to forget, especially these days, it's easy to forget that there is hope, that God does have a good future to you and He is making all things new. That you can trust Jesus with the most sacred and painful and holy and beautiful things of your life. And that you're not stuck. You can bring restoration because Jesus is already there, already in those places and with those people that you care about making all things new. And he invites you, come join me. So we make a choice every day to follow Jesus. And this choice, we speak to each other, this choice, again, recommitting ourselves to be a follower of Jesus. Would you read this with me? A disciple is one who walks intentionally with God, choosing to be changed by Jesus, choosing to seek Jesus first, and choosing to join Jesus in his resurrection work. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, will you come fill this place right now? Fill the, the room in which we're sitting, the car in, that we're driving in, the place that we are right now, Jesus. As we record, fill this place with your Spirit. Open our ears and our hearts and our spirits to what you would have us to say. God, I bind up and mute everything opposed to Jesus that would be seeking to interfere with this time now in Jesus' name. God, this is holy ground, a precious and holy moment, and we give it to you. Help us, Jesus. Protect us. We give you this time in our very hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So last week, Paul preached a, a wonderful sermon on the upside-down nature of the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, this is the Beatitudes, right? Jesus says, when you elevate yourself above others, Woe to you, watch out. But when you're humbled, that's when you're blessed. When your only satisfaction is what you hold in your grip, woe to you, watch out. But when you have nothing but tears in the presence of God, then you're blessed. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Everything is, seems to be upside down. Why? Why is this so? Why does this make sense in the kingdom of God? Well, read with me Luke chapter 6, verse 36, because this is the controlling sentence or idea of Jesus' entire Sermon on the Mount. Here we go. Read it. Let's read it together. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So remember the definition of mercy? Um, that mercy is not getting what I deserve. Now, this is true, but then we ask, well, how then does God give me mercy? And where you and I get into trouble is when we assume that God gives mercy as though he has this large mercy bucket with an unlimited amount of mercy in it, and he just sort of gives it out. Like God is a doting grandpa who's a billionaire and when you wreck his classic car, he says, you know what, no big deal. I have like a thousand more of those in my garage. And so with this sort of understanding of mercy, that God has this enormous bucket of unlimited mercy resources, and he just gives it to anybody, with this understanding of mercy, you and I, we, we think, well, why would God be stingy with mercy? And so to withhold mercy would be kind of cruel from God. And I mean, he's got enough to spare. And so that's, that's how people think about mercy. And as a result, uh, they think that God is going to just let them into heaven after they've spent their entire lives choosing hell. It, and this is a profound misunderstanding of mercy. Mercy is not getting what I deserve because 
Jesus endures it for me. Mercy is not getting what I deserve because Jesus endures it for me. That's different, right? My failure, my betrayals, my selfishness, my lusts, my bitterness. Jesus bears the full and dreadful spiritual consequences of my choices, of your choices, in His very body on the cross. And that unfathomable, unfathomable suffering of hell, Jesus endures that for you and me as a substitute in our place. Your life, my life, it's defined by mercy. Mercy is literally the suffering of Jesus as my substitute. And, and that's why, that's why the Beatitudes make sense. That's why I'm blessed even when I'm wrecked. Because the mercy of God reminds me that my story isn't defined by heartache or grief or someone else's betrayals. I, I'm blessed when I'm poor because the mercy of God reminds me that God is rich and that He rescues me from my poverty and elevates me to a place of, of heavenly right standing with God. I, I'm, we're the winners of the cosmic eternal lottery. Who cares how much money we have in our bank account? But what have you and I received to refuse the mercy of God? What are we going to do? If I say, well, I don't need mercy. I, you know, I've, I'm a good person. I haven't done anything wrong. I'm not that bad. What happens is that we'll end up stuffing ourselves from this beautiful buffet table the world offers us. But the thing is, is that we'll never be satisfied. And that's what Jesus says. Woe to you. Woe to you who seek comfort, who fill yourselves with the things of the world because you're never going to be satisfied. If I refuse God's mercy, then I will refuse God's comfort. You and I know this one well. How comforting really are the things that you use and seek to fill that void. They never satisfy, ever. Woe to me. Woe to you. How about if, if I refuse God's mercy towards me in my relationships, then I'm going to seek approval from everybody because I don't have God's approval, so I don't have a solid, firm ground to stand on, and therefore I'll become a, an emotional vampire, always seeking to pull the mercy out from other people and their approval and their love of me. That's why there's so many vampire movies, by the way. It's codependence writ large. Woe to me. Woe to you. Mercy is not getting what I deserve because Jesus endures it for me. So before we start the sermon, will you receive the mercy of Jesus with me? We're going to pray. Are you ready? It's real easy. It goes like this. Jesus, I'm a wreck and I need your mercy. I'm in desperate need of your mercy. That's it. Are you ready? Let me pray this with you. And just repeat after me. Jesus, I'm a wreck, and I'm in desperate need of your mercy. Have mercy on me. Amen. I can hear your doubt and cynicism from here. I, I know what that voice sounds like, too. It sounds like this. Yeah, Andy, great, I need mercy. But do you know what this person did to me? Do you know the pain that I'm in right now? Do you know what kind of suffering I'm in? I'm surrounded by people yet feel utterly alone. Do you have any idea how the court system or my boss or this group of people or that job or that church wrecked my life? See, what gets in the way of you and I fully receiving mercy is our wounds. That's the first thing that gets in the way. There's, Jesus is going to address one more. That'll be at the end of the sermon. The first is our wounds. See, I don't want to give mercy when I'm not confident that Jesus is actually going to deal with the person who hurt me. And this is why Jesus immediately commands us. It's not a suggestion. It's a command 
to apply mercy to those who've wrecked us. Read this verse with me, verse 37. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Do not, do not, do not, what? Do not be the judge. Do not condemn. Jesus is telling us to try to, he's telling us, stop trying to do my job. I'm the only one who judges. I'm the only one who has the capacity to see all of the facts and weigh them fairly without revenge and then judge them and condemn what is sin so that things work out better. And what is God's condemnation and judgment regarding my long list of failures? Well, I'm guilty. My goose is cooked. I've earned all the condemnation coming my way completely and thoroughly. God's judgment of my rebellion is just and fair. I wanted a life apart from God, a life where I could do what I wanted with my money and my body and my attitudes and my words with zero accountability. I wanted God way out there. That's called hell, by the way. And that's what I chose. And sometimes it's still what I choose. But then God himself in the flesh, Jesus, descended from the throne of judgment to, the, to endure the eternal consequences of everything I've chosen. This is called the mercy of Jesus. Though I was guilty, Jesus pays my debt. And I'm forgiven. Though I'm I was stained, Jesus washes me clean and takes that stain, that shame upon himself on the cross. Though I was dead, Jesus dies for me so that now I can have his resurrection life. Do not judge. Do not condemn. Jesus endured your condemnation. So let me ask you a question. Do you think it's a good strategy to dish out the very thing that Jesus just saved you from? Ah, but maybe you're not convinced. So let me ask you, how's it going? How's it working out for you being the judge, jury, and executioner of everybody around you? Because you don't just judge and condemn others, do you? I mean, I know you're right about politics and about that person and that neighbor and that friend and your parent and your brother and your spouse and your sister and your kids. I know you're right about them, but the judgment doesn't stop there, does it? You judge yourself. And you judge yourself far more cruelly than anyone ever could. You, living with you, judge yourself nonstop. How's it working for you? See, the moment that you judge others, the judgment comes back to you. Jesus, Jesus describes it this way, verse 38, Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. That's an image of, of this idea that, that the more that you give, the more that you will receive, and the opposite is true. The more that you withhold, the more that will be withheld from, from you. Jesus says, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Whatever it is that you give, it's coming back. We judge, we get judged. We give generously, generosity is returned. We spew forth bitterness and people will resent us back. But it's more than just individually what happens in our life. See, when we judge others for their mistakes, we will become the person that we've judged. And, and you, you and I know this. We judged our parents for how they treated us, and then all of a sudden we wake up horrified one day as we listen to the same words come out of our mouths that our parents once spoke to us. We become the people that we judge. And, and this is 
This is not just, again, limited to individuals. This, is, this happens nationally as well. When the German people lost World War I in 1918 and Kaiser Wilhelm was deposed and the Austrian-Hungarian Empire was cracked apart and um, it, it started this era in Germany in which the narrative of the German people was that their economy was being wrecked because, because of the harsh, harsh sanctions. And their economy wasn't wrecked because of the harsh sanctions. It was because of, well, it was because of a lot of reasons, but it had to do with their poor economic policy. And so inflation happened during the Weimar period. This is Germany in the 1920s. And it would take a wheelbarrow full of money in order to buy one loaf of bread. It was unbelievable. And poor poverty and starving and, and wreckage of the economy like, like never before. And all of these different politicians and leaders and poets and philosophers and even old Jewish artists that wanted to start a new political movement called National Socialism, they all said the same thing, which is that the whole world was out to get them. And so Germany, as a nation, judged that the whole world was out to get them. And then fast forward 20 years later, 1944, guess what? The whole world is out to get Germany. Why? Because they started a world war. They, they, they judged the world, and then as a nation, they created the exact conditions where that judgment would come back and be fulfilled. Do not judge. Do not condemn. So what do we do? We forgive. Jesus says, forgive just as you have forgiven. Jesus uses the Greek word here, ap apolio, apolio. Uh, there's two words for forgive, afiemi and apolio. And here Jesus' words, ap apolio. And apolio means to free fully, to release, to let die. So what am I letting go of? What am I releasing? Or what am I letting die when I forgive? What's what Jesus just said in verse 37? Do not condemn, do not judge. I'm letting go of the right to condemn. I'm letting go of my right to be judge. To forgive is to give up your right to judge and condemn, handing that right back to Jesus who is the only good judge. Does that make sense? To forgive is to give up my right to judge. Forgiveness, therefore, is not forgetting. Forgiveness carries with it a just accusation. Matt's here recording with me. If I say to Matt, Matt, I forgive you, he would say, what for? Because why? Because there is a just accusation in it. So when you forgive, you're remembering the offense, not for the sake of resentment, but for the sake of giving that person mercy, of handing your right to judge over to Jesus. Now, for years, I refused to forgive. For the first 15, 20 years of my life, I just assumed that I had no wounds. And for the next 10 years of my life, I just refused to acknowledge those wounds. And then in my 30s, I just refused. I knew that I had the wounds, but I just I wanted to hold on to my bitterness. I was working at the time for a man, my senior pastor at First Press San Luis Obispo, who made my life hell. And he belittled me, he kept my head under the water, he worked against me, he absolutely refused to mentor or help me. Um, it was a nightmare. And so five years, I, I nursed my resentments against him. But more importantly, I rehearsed my resentments against myself because I hated myself way more than I hated my boss. I didn't want to admit that. I've only realized that since, since that time. But I was anxious and vain and, and prideful all at the same time. At night, I would deal with my pain by numbing and my drinking became more and more and more out of control. But during the day, I pretended that I was a great pastor and all was fine. And I found myself lying to other people to make myself look better or to hide my mistakes. And I rarely prayed except when I was doing ministry. I was a mess. And my resentments against my boss, they were tiny compared to the mountain of resentments that I had against me. But then my first year as your pastor, this 11 years ago, I got dragged into an AA meeting. 
and it was it actually wasn't 11 years ago, it was 10 years ago last Sunday on February 14th. And I've been sober 10 years. And over the past decade of sobriety, I have learned to forgive and let go of the resentments I have towards others and myself. Why? Why would I do that? Because in, in forgiveness is this demand for justice. With that just accusation, say there's, there has to be payment, there has to be blood for what you've done. And I have blood. I have payment. That cry for someone to feel the pain that I've felt is answered. It's answered with Jesus. I have his blood to pay my debt. I have his cry to let me know that my pain is taken seriously. On the cross, I'm given all the evidence that I need that justice is fully accomplished. And at the same time on the cross, mercy is given to me because I hate myself for all the mistakes that I've made and I've prosecuted myself for the ways in which I've hurt and wrecked my kids or the ways in which I've hurt and wrecked my marriage or my precious wife or even the ways that I've damaged my own soul. And Jesus gives me mercy and so I can receive it. I don't have to prosecute myself anymore. When Jesus said, it's finished, it's finished. So how do we, how do we forgive? How do we do this? Well, it's going to be on the screen before you, but let me read it for you first so you know what you're getting into. We forgive like this. Jesus, I've been wounded. What they did to me, what I've done to me, it's wrong. Let me pause here for a moment. You're going to always be specific about what you're forgiving someone for. You, forgiveness is surgery. No one gets generalized surgery on the upper half of their body. You have to be surgical, specific about what you're actually forgiving someone for. So let me start it again. But again, I'm just giving you a generalized prayer that you'll be able to see and read and write down and you can press pause and write it down and then and then you can be specific in your time with God as you pray. So Jesus, I was wounded. What they did to me, what I've done to me, it's wrong. But I'm no good at trying to do your job. Forgive me for thinking I'm a better judge than you. And now I hand over the right to judge the one who wounded me deeply. I forgive them now in your name, Jesus. I am in need of mercy, and so I give them mercy. <sighs> Will you pray that with me? Will you make that a prayer? Maybe it's not right now. Maybe, to, maybe right now you're just getting oriented to, to the reality that, oh my gosh, I've got someone that I need to forgive. Because every single time I'm talking about this, you're picturing that person in your mind. Now you have the resource. Let me ask you a question. Are you willing to give mercy to that person? Let me ask you a harder question. Are you willing to give mercy to yourself? Please do. There's one last roadblock in the way of mercy and forgiveness, and it's our blindness. Many of you know this, but my wife is slowly going blind. Gratefully, April's loss of vision is right now limited to her right eye. Her, her left eye is totally fine. But over the past seven years, April's lost 80% of her vision in her right eye, and the last year it's really accelerated. And so I asked April yesterday, I said, are you aware of your vision loss? 
or you, like can you see the blank, the the black spots in your vision or or is uh, your brain kind of gotten used to it and now it's just kind of is what it is and she told me i'm i'm very aware of what i can no longer see um, i'm conscious of those blank spots in my vision where there was one sight and i don't think i'll ever get quite used to it that's april's brain realizing okay we're losing something here and she has the scope of what she once saw but now she realizes that there's lots of missing pieces our son jonah is also blind on his right side jonah's entire left brain was removed to save his life from life-threatening seizures almost eight years ago and when you, he, they removed his entire left brain, they also removed that, the back of his brain, which is responsible for sight, called the occipital lobe. And this means that my son has no vision on the right side of both of his eyes. Now, there's nothing wrong with his eyes. His eyes are fine. It's the fact that his left brain is now gone. That's the issue. So if uh, this is his sight and his, uh, his right eye and his left eye, the, the, the right side of his vision is now gone. Does that make sense? So both eyes can see, it's just that the right side of the vision is gone, whereas the left side is still remains. And the thing about Jonah is that he is totally unaware that his vision has been reduced. Why? Well, because that part of his brain, that left occipital lobe that would tell him, I don't have any vision, that's gone. So when Jonah was relearning how to walk, he would just run into stuff like poles and walls and doors and stuff because he literally couldn't, he didn't know that it was not there. It was absent. It was gone. It'd be like, what's directly behind your head right now, right? It's just, it doesn't exist because it's not there. Now, all of us is, are going to spend a season of our life, and maybe it's a year, maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's 25 years. All of us will spend a season of our life absolutely blind to our need for mercy and forgiveness. And we're not blind like April's blind. We're blind like Jonah's blind. We're totally unaware that we have these massive blind spots in our lives. And the only way that we find out that we have a blind spot in our life is when we run into people and it causes pain. Jesus puts it like this. Verse 41. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? And the thing about our blind spots is that our generation, our worldview, our little tribes that we belong to, they all have blind spots. So guess what? You have blind spots I have blind spots. Now, I've had the fortune, fortune of, of being a part of a lot of different tribes that don't necessarily talk to each other. And it's really interesting to see the blind spots of those particular tribes. For example, I've, I have a collection of, of reproduction Civil War era black powder pistols. I cast my own uh, little bullets and, you know, put black powder in them and then make them go boom, it's a riot. And when I go to the to the shooting range. Everybody else is shooting their modern guns and I'm shooting my black powder pistols and this huge cloud of, cloud of, cloud of billowing smoke comes out and all the guys, you know, oh, what's that? You know, whoa, you know, check it out. And so we're having a ball and it's, it's a blast every single time I go. <laughs> and at some point in that day or half a day on the range, I will overhear a, co a conversation from a, gump, a bunch of gun guys talking about how um, you know, politicians or people who are against guns, they'll just talk about those group of people. And I can tell you, after hearing those conversations, they, the, the gun group has some, some blind spots. I, when I was in seminary, I sold cigars for a living. That's what I did for a job. And uh, so I'd work at this little uh, cigar shop called A Little Taste of Cuba. And in Princeton, New Jersey, it's the highest concentration of hedge fund managers in the world. Hedge funds are the, the funds that lost billions of dollars and rigged the stock market a couple of weeks ago with the whole Robin Hood, GameStop, AMC fiasco. So if you know the news, there you go. Hedge funds are these 
it's where really, really rich millionaires and billionaires and large institutions hide their money and also get fantastic returns, far more than you and I will ever get. And so all of them, all of them were, were liberal Democrats, every single one of them, and it was amazing to watch of them, watch them. We'd all smoke cigars together. They had no idea I was in seminary or who I was. They just assumed I was like them. And they would talk about conservatives and poor people and why they were idiots and morons. And I can tell you that rich, near billionaire liberals have some serious blind spots. I love baby boomers. Baby boomers have some serious blind spots when they talk about millennials. I'm a Gen Xer. I know that the reason why the world is screwed up is because of baby boomers. And, but I don't have any blind spots about that. That's good. Ready? Verse 42. Jesus says, How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you, you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your eye and then you'll be able to see clearly. Mm. <laughs> I messed that one up. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye and then you will be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying this. Hey, when you have a plank in your eye, it's hard to see. And then you move stuff around and then you, you bang stuff around. But hope, oh, hey, Matt, let me help you. Hey, have you noticed that you have a sliver in your eye, Matt? Look, I don't want to judge or condemn you. I know it's painful. Matt, could I help you? You know, I can see real clearly that you have some issues here, Matt. Um, uh, why are you looking at me like that? Uh, do, you know, don't, don't you want my help? Mm-hmm. Hold still. <laughs> What's Jesus saying? Don't pretend that you don't judge and condemn people. Because you do. You judge and condemn people that you disagree with, that, you, that are your political opposites, that you, your parents, your wayward kids, your spouse, your brother, your sister, your friend. Stop pretending that the plank isn't in your own eye. Yes, they have a sliver in their eye. Yes, you're allowed to point that out and help them. You're allowed to speak the truth. This is the thing about forgiveness, is that you can speak the truth, but you just don't get to be their judge and jury and executioner. So you can say abortion is wrong, because it is. And racism is wrong, because it is. And the financial tools that banks use to prey on poor people is wrong. And it is. And the for-profit prison system, which has infected our sentencing guidelines that are unfairly applied to our black brothers and sisters, it's wrong. And it is. Our cancel culture is wrong. Our victim culture is wrong. Our violence is wrong. But I'm not their judge, jury, and executioner. I say that knowing that I have a plank in my own eye, that I'm in desperate need of mercy too. Jesus finishes this sermon with this. He says this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Jesus is saying, like, why do you delay obedience? I'm giving you the tools to repair the world. I'm giving you the tools to repair your family. You think condemnation and judgment is going to help anything? Oh, you think being right is more important than, than, than leading with mercy? You know what would bring your family together? You know what would bring your marriage together? You know what would bring this country together if millions upon millions of Christians started every conversation like this? Look, I know that I'm in desperate need of mercy, and I get things wrong all the time. 
And I also know what hell smells like because I've made my own little hell right here on earth. And I know that this issue that we have with each other or this issue in our country, it smells like hell. But the way that God has rescued me was to be merciful towards me and to forgive me. So that's how I know how to start because that's how problems are solved. That's how hell is defeated. It's through mercy and forgiveness. So that's how I'm going to treat you and that's how I'm going to treat this problem. So maybe we and I, you and I, we could figure out where to start. What if we started conversations like that? Wouldn't that be better? Wouldn't that work? What difference would it make if your parent or your kid or your sibling or your spouse came to you and said, I'm in desperate need of mercy. I'm so sorry I messed up. It would change everything. Jesus paints it like this. As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I'll show you what they are like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. And when a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. What is Jesus saying to you? Build your marriage, build your parenting, build your business, build your friendships, all on mercy and forgiveness. And when the storms of life come, your marriage will not fail, your business will not be shaken, your family will be safe and secure because your foundation is how God treats you. And that never can be shaken. Jesus is saying, don't think about mercy, give mercy, ask for mercy. He says, don't ask for the strength to forgive, forgive. Do not delay obedience. This is not a suggestion. This is a command. And let's say you delay. Let's say you dismiss because you know what? You're not that bad. And look, I, I'm, I'm not a judgmental person, you say. And I mean, my plank isn't that bad. I'm the guy with the sliver, right? What's going to happen when the storms come? Maybe you didn't create the storm. Maybe it's just a pandemic happens or somebody else has a problem in their life. What's going to happen? Verse 49. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. I'm going to end with this. I had three conversations this week with three different friends. And all of them, their whole life is collapsing right now. One of them told me about how he has wrecked his relationships. He's blown up his marriage. And he, he was in pieces. This is a man who desperately needs to ask for mercy. And if you're that person right now, Maybe, maybe your failure was like a couple of years ago, but you just sort of whitewashed it and moved on. Or maybe you apologized, but maybe you need to check in with your spouse or your friend or your kid and say, I know I hurt you and I'm in need of mercy. Is there anything else we need to talk about because I want to make it right? I talked to another friend this week and he had just been wrecked by the decisions of someone in his family. And then a friend. And then another friend. He was in desperate need of forgiving them. He had to be the one who to forgive, who was going to forgive. And, and so we did that together. We forgave. And maybe you're the person right now where you're the one who's been hurt. You're the one who's been left holding the bag. You're the one who's had to clean up the mess. And you don't want to get hurt again. And so your strategy is just to pull back a little bit, but that's killing you. And, and today God's word is saying, no, no, no. It's time to say, yep, this is wrong. But now to hand them over to Jesus, to let Jesus judge them. Maybe that's you today. 
Or maybe you're the, you're the guy who you just woke up to the reality that you've had a plank in your life, this, in your life and in your eye this entire time. You just woke up to realize that your attitude about these type of people or this type of situation or, or that person in your life or your attitude about God, it's been blinded and obscured and, and now you're waking up to the reality that, oh my gosh, I've been blind to the full truth of what's happening here. Maybe you need to admit that to a friend or to God in prayer or to a trusted companion so that you can ask forgiveness, so that you can forgive. You can do the work that you need to do because now you can see. Don't delay. Don't wait. Do not condemn. Do not judge. Be merciful, for you will receive mercy. Forgive, just as Jesus has forgiven you. Amen? Amen. Jesus, bless and seal these words in our heart. There's, these are hard ones, God. But this is the work. This is the holy work that you would have us do. This is where our hope comes from. Because Despair is destroyed when we pray these prayers. This is us trusting you, Jesus, choosing to have mercy and to forgive. This is how we bring restoration to the world. God, protect all the truth that you've spoken through me today to these beautiful, beloved people. Guard their hearts, protect them, bless them, help them right now as, as they stop this video to take the time to pray and to, to not delay. God, make holy space in their life, in their marriages, with their kids and with their grandkids to have these important conversations. Protect them from all the enemy's attacks right now, in Jesus' name. And God, grow in them. God, grow in them. A tree of life and hope and mercy and peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance, that's his delight in you, and give you the peace that passes all understanding. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you guys. I love you. See you soon. Enjoy the outtakes. They're pretty good. <laughs>
and he knows what I need. In the silence I choose to believe, you're working in The future isn't clear to me. Oh, I trust you anyway. Every breath I breathe, an invitation to believe you are creating something good. Though this season doesn't tell my story, I know you. I don't have enough Cause he's more than enough And he knows what I need So I'll give thanks to God When I don't have enough Cause he's more than enough And he knows what I need Yeah, he knows what I need Uh, That's crazy. That. You didn't just. 
Are you making this happen for me? <laughs> you hear that? I keep hearing like a. That's so weird. Is it happening again right now? No, it happened for a second and it went. <laughs> what are you doing? Well, I'm not doing Did you hear it? <laughs> no. <laughs> You're crazy. What are you no, talking about? No, I'm not. It's happening. You're making me crazy now. I'm telling you, man. It's... I am so convinced that you're actually hearing this, but I, I know you're lying. No, I'm t <laughs> it keeps going, coming and going. Are you recording this? I am. Oh, good. Hopefully it picks up that frequency and I can... Here, I'm going to stop the camera. <laughs> I'm going to record with this one. And I'm going to prove it. <laughs> you're so full of crap. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> uh, if that's all the louder it goes. Matt. That is not, no. <laughs> of Wait. course you can't hear it. I thought I just did. <laughs> I, I think you're playing with me right now. <laughs> you don't hear that? <laughs> no. What the heck? What are you talking about? What is happening? <coughs> Is this feeding back the headphones? I am deaf in some tonal frequencies. That could that could be an explanation. Yeah. So I have a real raw high pitch, and then also the middle tone, which is the exact tone of my wife's voice. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, if I go back and, and hear the ringing in this camera when I get home, <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> what are you going to do? I'm going to send it to you. Send it to you. <laughs> I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. I'm, I'm going to show you a frequency meter. And you're wrong. It's happening. <laughs> it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. You see that pink? I am pink. not crazy. I swear. 15K, right there. He's nuts. <laughs>